We're going to move on to some big picture and future questions. Okay. Uh, the first one that I was hoping to ask would be, how soon can we implement high, high capacity transit to Tiger and the Barber Corridor? Is completion by 2020 possible? Um, I think 2020 would be an optimistic, um, and it may depend on you know, the technology that's selected. We talked about BRT at one point in time. If it's light rail, um, it would be, I, I think 2020 would be pretty optimistic. One of the reasons for that is that the uh, federal government prescribes, if you're part of the New START program, which I presume this would be, a fairly long and elaborate uh, study process that includes um, draft environmental impact statement and, as well as um, other work. Um, we're just beginning now with work of Metro and uh, many other participating jurisdictions to look at this corridor and they're looking at it from the standpoint of land use first. What's the right land use pattern around um, this corridor? And then I think the decisions about the transportation that serves that land use will follow. But clearly it's a major corridor. When I look at a, a map of TriMet volumes geographically, that's one area where we're not catching, if you will, the economics of light rail uh, in a big way. And we would uh, be able to have a lot more service, I think, in that corridor, a lot more seats for people if we had light rail there. That doesn't mean that it's trying to preclude other modes like BRT if they are selected, but I would say that um, um, it's you know an open question uh, and going to be an interesting study over the next few years. We asked, if 2020 is a bit too soon for high-capacity transit on Barber, what could be done to help riders in the near term on routes like the number 12, which has crowding and on-time performance issues? Well, I think, again, we're going to come down to resources. And as resources are allow, I do think the number 12, I agree with you, I use the number 12 on a very regular basis, uh, does have some, um, some, some issues related to reliability. And part of that is that it's a very long line, as you know. It goes all the way out Park Rose and beyond and, and all the way into Sherwood. And, and so it's a very, um, very long line and that in itself does cause some problems. So one of the things I think service planning will look to do in the future, I don't think that this is something we can afford to do in the very near term, but look to do in the future is to begin to look at ways to break that up into some, a smaller line or combine it with other lines that allow it to be more on time. And one of our strategies has always been to build bus service and corridors before any other higher capacity mode is, is implemented, and this would be the case here too. We asked Neil about statistics from some critics which claim the transit is more expensive to operate than small cars in terms of cost per passenger mile, and the transit does not really reduce CO2 emissions. Can TriMet show serious independent research which backs claims of transit's cost savings and energy efficiency, or would it be better to provide those in need with cars rather than operate public transit at current levels? Um, let me try to answer it um, this way. There, the region, Metro in particular, together with all the other governments in the region, puts together a regional transportation plan, which attempts to balance the modes of transportation overall. And um, what we have seen in the various iterations of regional transportation plans over time has been a call for more and more and more transit. One of the questions about what if we just bought everybody a little car, what if we bought everybody a smart car? Well, I think there's a real question about where on the road would they go? Um, one of the uh, interesting conversations we've been having with the city of Portland staff They'd love to be able to, in the city of Portland, to be able to absorb some of that million people that Metro projects will come to the region over the next 20 years or so. But there's not going to be any new roads in Portland. There's not going to be any, any place to put those cars. And so they're going to, they see that there is an important reliance on two things, active transportation and transit, public transit. And that's how they, they're going to build the city in the future. And I, I try my role is to support that and to help make that happen. So I hope, I, and I believe that the regional transportation plans do some very effective studies and modeling of these various scenarios and various models of more auto dependent versus less transit. And they, one of the key objectives is to reduce um, pollution from the overall transportation system, whether it's CO2 or anything else. Um, and again, that's why we're seeing a direction more toward active transportation and transit as key solutions. TriMet is over 40, Max is nearly 25. 
what is your vision of the TriMet system 25 or even 40 years from now? Well, that's a great question. Currently, we, um, we serve over 330,000 trips a day. That's approaching 100 million trips in an annual basis. My hope in uh, 20, 30 years, we're, we've doubled or more in terms of our total ridership. Um, <clears throat> the objective would be to have fast, convenient service in all of our major radio, regional corridors in that we've expanded our frequent service li um, lines to a much broader part of our map. And that we're serving a vibrant, alive city. One of the things that people um, sometimes um, I, I actually will, will quote one of our media people here that um, often says when she got offered a job here that she was here, why don't I got to talk about buses? And you find out when you're at Tremont you're not here just to talk about but You're talking about building a wonderful system that includes buses, includes rail, includes streetcar, that serves a vibrant, growing city, a strong economic city. And that's what we want to do. We want to be a part of that. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, um, Portland's known as a leader within the U.S. for its existing transit uh, policies. Are there any agencies from around the country that you plan, as head of TriMet, to take a look at and attempt to learn from? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think there's actually a lot to learn all around the country and actually overseas as well. Um, one of the uh, agencies that I think has been doing an amazing job, given what they've got to work with, is UTA in, trans in Utah, um, in Salt Lake City. Built a, a, a lot of uh, projects are beginning to improve their bus service, but frankly their bus service right now is quite skeletal compared to what TriMet offers. But nonetheless have been doing a great, a great job in what is kind of a sprawling environment. So that's one to look at. I think there's other um, interesting BRT cities. Actually, Eugene, you mentioned earlier, it's going to be wonderful uh, to see that. I know that you know the Sacred Heart Hospital just opened in uh, Springfield. It's served by the new um, BRT line. Um, some interesting investments going on there. Um, and so I think that's important to watch. And that's a local example. Other examples are, for example, Los Angeles. Um, believe it or not, the, the auto empire there in Southern California is beginning to make a turn to some really terrific transit investments. There was an article in the New York Times just the other day in their square feet section about transit-oriented development around one of the new uh, light rail lines being planned and built in the Los Angeles area. So there's a lot of examples throughout the country that I think we can continue to learn from um, and should continue to track and learn from. I'd also say one of the things I'm looking for is the, and if any of your uh, uh, readers uh, know of great places where their bus technology is cutting edge, that's another place I'd, I'd like to learn more, for, more about. Actually, one of our readers did ask a question about uh, what type of federal funding would it get to restore the hyphen to the TriMet name? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the first uh, letter would start with a B uh, and go from there. But um, there, are, um, a lot of people love the hyphen, but you know, personally, I can do without it. So that's just a personal opinion, I know. Well, works for me. All right. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you.